My name is Unmesh uh, and my colleague Saloni. Uh, so last uh, few years we have been working with uh, this interesting project uh, called 30 meter telescope. Uh, and we, uh, we used uh, an actor model, uh, ACA framework, uh, and, and built a framework to be used for software development for this telescope. So we'll be talking about some of, uh, some of our learnings uh, and how actor model uh, was a great suit uh, for, for uh, this project. So here is what we are. We are both from ThoughtWorks, uh, uh, and ThoughtWorks is uh, uh, working with 30 meter telescope uh, uh, for, for this engagement. A, a quick uh, look at what 30 meter telescope is. Uh, so when I say uh, 30 meter, it's the uh, it's the diameter of the primary mirror of the telescope. Uh, and this is one of the extremely large telescopes that are getting built. So in the world, uh, currently there are three telescopes uh, that are getting built. Uh, one is 30 meters. Uh, the other is getting built by European Union, uh, which is slightly bigger than this. So uh, then this becomes like the second largest if that goes live first. Uh, this will be operational uh, in 2027. So it's a, it's a large program, uh, like 10 more years to go. Uh, it will be uh, built in Hawaii, uh, and there are five countries uh, collaborating on this, uh, US, Canada, China, Japan, and India. Uh, software development uh, is primarily happening from India, uh, but each country is contributing uh, on, on different parts. Uh, if, you, if you need more information, uh, uh, they have a website uh, called www.tmt.org. Uh, and it's a very, very interesting uh, stuff out there. So I talked about uh, the, the size of primary mirror. So this, this I took from Wikipedia uh, uh, information on, on 30 meter telescope. So this just gives you a relative sizing uh, of, so left side if you see the smaller dots, um, those are all the existing telescopes. Uh, and if you see on the same scale uh, at the bottom right is the baseball court. Uh, and on the left uh, is, is the tennis court. So this, the, the top one is the 30 meters. So that will be the size of, of the mirror for that telescope. Uh, and you can imagine uh, if the mirror is that big, uh, you, will, you will need a supporting structure, um, a lot of systems to control and coordinate uh, those mirrors and a lot of other things. Uh, the, the middle one, that's the other one, uh, other telescope that's getting built by European Union. That's uh, the extremely large telescope uh, that's getting built by uh, European Union. Uh, and, and this one, I think, is the, uh, the giant Magellan telescope. So these three are in progress work. Just to give you a quick, quick overview of, uh, of this program, um, and it's very interesting because, I mean, for people like us who work with enterprise systems, these time scales are, are, <laughs> are something uh, very, very mind-boggling. Uh, so this, this particular program for TMT, uh, it's a 20-year program. So it started somewhere in, in 2007, uh, maybe even, even before that. Uh, and telescope will be operational in 2027. Uh, once it, like the first, after the first light, like you start taking the first observation, it's expected to be operational for 50 more years. Uh, and, and that's a very uh, important thing to note because then the, the software tools uh, that you choose, you have to make sure 50 years after 2027, um, those things are relevant and, and can be managed. Uh, as I said, software development uh, is, is primarily happening uh, in India. So we have been working with this, uh, uh, with, with TMT teams uh, from 20, uh, 20, 2014. Uh, in, in the first few years, we primarily built uh, some prototypes uh, using Akka. Uh, and now we are responsible for building uh, what is called as common software. Uh, and I will talk of uh, what, what common software means. So, so as, as we said, uh, as, as I just talked about, um, like this telescope is a, is a huge structure and you will have multiple subsystems uh, which are part of the telescope hardware and software uh, and managing that. So you build, uh, you need an ecosystem of services and tools uh, where, uh, where all this will fit in. 
<clears throat> so common software, what we are working on uh, is, is set of these things. So uh, a service discovery mechanism, um, so that all these subsystems and components can um, discover each other. Um, there is a configuration management service, uh, which is backed by a uh, version control system. Uh, that, that's uh, very interesting uh, in itself. Um, there is a centralized logging uh, a mechanism to capture event and telemetry data. Uh, there is a timer API uh, that we need to work on because there are very, very uh, specific timing requirements. Uh, and we need to set up uh, a PTP uh, on, on the Linux uh, boxes the, uh, where the components will be deployed. Um, and, uh, and lastly, the framework uh, using type factors which will be used by uh, all the subsystem developers uh, to code their, their, their systems and, and their software. So in this talk, we'll be primarily talking about uh, the, the last point there, uh, the, the type factors uh, based framework uh, that we built and how type factors were, were a good fit. Uh, but maybe uh, next few years, we'll talk about some of, some of the other things. Uh, like e each topic there is a, is a topic for a good talk. So I will, uh, before going into actors, uh, I will just briefly talk about uh, how the telescope uh, system looks like from hardware and software perspective. Uh, so at, at the lowest level, so it's, it's a layered system. Uh, at the lowest level, um, uh, we can see there are a lot many hardware devices uh, with embedded software um, on, on those devices. Uh, and there are hundreds of those. Uh, each uh, having its own communication protocol uh, to talk to the software that's on the higher level. The next level uh, is, is the software processes uh, which understand how to talk to these hardware devices. Uh, and we call them as hardware control demons, uh, which are uh, more like device drivers for, uh, for these uh, hardware devices. A layer above that uh, is a sus subsystem level uh, controller, like uh, a single subsystem, like uh, uh, like it's a telescope control system, which which is responsible for moving the telescope. It talks to uh, let's say tens of uh, or or maybe hundreds of motors, uh, and each of those motors will be controlled by a single uh, instance of hardware control demon. And all of those will be controlled by uh, a controller, which is uh, which we are calling as uh, as assembly. And for each subsystem in the in the telescope uh, system, uh, you will have an assembly and and a bunch of hardware control demands talking to uh, different hardware devices. A layer above that uh, is uh, something called as a sequencer, uh, which coordinates all the subsystems while you take an observation. So when you submit an observation uh, to the telescope and operator controls uh, these telescopes, uh, they will essentially need to control um, the, the entire, like all, all the subsystems uh, in this telescope. Like you, you move the telescope to a particular object or a particular portion of the sky, you track that, sky, track that portion throughout, let's say, next eight hours uh, while the Earth moves, um, you calibrate, uh, and, and then maybe start taking pictures. So, so all that sequencing uh, happens uh, in this sequencing uh, sequencer layer. Um, and then the sequencer layer talks to uh, the applications which, uh, which the telescope operator uh, will, will be using. Uh, so this is uh, broadly how, how the entire, uh, you know, entire telescope software and hardware uh, coordinates. Uh, or, or uh, works <clears throat> are structured. Uh, I will just take like one uh, example, uh, just to slightly more deep dive into uh, how these components work. Uh, so when you first start taking an observation, the first thing you do is, uh, let's say you move a telescope, like you, you want to point to a specific uh, portion of the sky. So uh, your sequencer will send coordinates uh, to your TCS assembly, like the subsystem that's responsible for moving the telescope. Uh, and this assembly uh, will in turn talk to uh, multiple subsystems for moving the telescope. The probe arm is, is one of the subsystems. Uh, 
which is which uh, controls the motors which move the telescope. Uh, so it will talk to this probe arm assembly, uh, and probe arm assembly because it knows uh, about all the hardware devices in in this probe arm uh, subsystem. Uh, it will calculate uh, what how much the the hardware uh, or motors need to be rotated or moved. Uh, and it will send corresponding commands to the individual hardware demons, uh, which then will talk to motor controllers. So this is how uh, the overall, uh, like for this movement of the telescope, uh, high level, this is, this is how the communication will happen. Now if you see the key characteristics uh, of, of this structure, uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. Uh, so you'll have components, uh, it's, it's not client server, so you'll have multiple components, they talk to each other. Um, so the first thing they need to do is they need to discover. Uh, they need to know uh, when the other component is live, uh, what the address of that component is, um, if it's down, uh, and then it should be able to send commands once it identifies uh, the other components and also subscribe to uh, the events. Like, like one of the things uh, that I shown in here uh, is uh, these hardware devices uh, will be continuously sending events to uh, the upper layer, like the assembly, uh, giving them the current state or current coordinates. The, the second important uh, aspect is all the communication happens with asynchronous message passing. Uh, so it's not like synchronous calls uh, or remote procedural calls. Uh, it's message passing, uh, sending messages, and then uh, receiving events. Uh, most of the communication is, is like that. And last, but the important fact uh, is that all these components are stateful. So hardware control demands, they maintain state per hardware device. Uh, sub subsystem level assemblies, they maintain state for a subsystem. And then, because they're stateful components, uh, concurrency becomes an important concern. Like, when there are multiple messages or events coming concurrently, how do you manage state? Uh, and safety uh, is the important. So if, if, if there is an exception that happens within a component, uh, you have to make sure that it's in a clean state uh, when the next command is processed. Uh, or you need to know when it's in a clean state. And these requirements are uh, extremely well suited for actors because if you see actors by their very nature support most of these requirements. Uh, the communication between actors is, is message, message passing. Uh, actors allow you to do uh, hassle-free state management, like you don't need to worry about concurrency uh, anymore and can manage state. Um, and, and safety, they give with all the supervision strategies that, that you can have with the actor system, uh, making sure that your actors are always uh, in a clean state uh, in, in the face of exceptions. Uh, the other uh, important thing is uh, your actors are location transparent. So <clears throat> even if your components, uh, which are actors, uh, maybe uh, are, are deployed anywhere um, on your network, um, you, once you get a reference to them, you can uh, make a call, and you don't need to worry if it's a local actor or a remote actor. So this uh, this was a thought, uh, like like because it was such a great fit. Uh, like few years back, uh, uh, it was it was decided uh, that the the core framework, uh, which will be used by all this component developers will be using actors. And, and we'll talk briefly uh, now about what that framework looks like. Uh, so before going there, maybe I'll talk now about how this will be deployed. Uh, so you can see there are obviously like uh, uh, your Linux machines on, on which all these components uh, will be deployed. We have built a, a service discovery mechanism to, uh, and, and what, how that works is that each, uh, each server that you have will always run, <coughs> run an agent uh, as part of that. And these agents will 
will form a cluster. They use Akka cluster um, and, and CRDT. So all these agents on, on the machines on which the on, on, uh, on the machines on which these components are deployed, they form uh, Akka cluster. They expose a HTTP API uh, so that components can register themselves on these agents. And uh, they, they also use something uh, called as server send events. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think, in, as part of HTML5. Uh, it's now standardized. So that components can uh, get events. This is very similar, uh, by the way, to uh, how console works. Like, you have like your console agents uh, as, as part of your infrastructure. Uh, because we are already using Akka, uh, we could get away with console. I mean, we, we could use Akka itself to, uh, to do what console does. <clears throat> and then we have uh, these components which talk to these agents uh, while they come up. So you have these component actors uh, when they come up, uh, when the JVM starts, they register themselves uh, to, uh, to these local agents. And because uh, the local agents form Akka cluster using CRDTs, uh, all the information essentially gets decimated to uh, all, the, all the other nodes uh, in, the, in the cluster. So, so this is high level uh, how, how the, the, the ecosystem looks like. Uh, next, we'll go uh, slightly more deep uh, into how actors are used uh, as, part of, uh, as part of this components. And I will just hand over to Saloni. Thank you, Anmesh. OK, so we have already seen that a component in TMT means a sequencer, assembly, or etcd. And assembly will generally require to discover a etcd, send commands, and handle the response. Assembly will do so by using the framework provided by us. Us means uh, the team in uh, India, ThoughtWorks India, is building this framework out of the actors. And assembly writers, etcd writers, and sequencer writers will be using this actor-based framework while writing the actual implementation of the component. So with this idea, let's try to understand the anatomy of a TMT component. The first thing is the supervisor. It is an actor provided by our framework. It is the first thing that gets created when a component is created. And it is the front facing of a component. So whenever external components want, wants to discover this component, it will be via the supervisor's actor reference. Once the supervisor is created, it goes on and spawns a top level actor. It is again an actor provided by our framework. And top level actor initializes handlers. Handlers are something that will be implemented by component writers. The relationship between top level actor and handlers is of a template method. If we have to understand handlers, these are a set of actions. Let's take a look at what handlers are in, in the code. Uh, it's not showing up, the code part. Skip over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we had some some code to show, but I mean, yeah, that's offline. that's okay. So handlers are a set of actions. For example, handlers will let you allow when uh, handlers will let you handle the initialization of a component, of validation of the command, execution of a command, or shutting down of a component. So component writers will end up writing the implementation of such kind of handlers. And top level actor is going to use these handlers and, sequence and, and, and decide the sequence of its execution. In this example, the top level actor, whenever it is started, it will call the initialize action on the handlers, and, and, and handlers will just do the job. Next thing is, handlers will end up spawning one or more worker actors. These are the actors which will be written by component developers. The job of the worker actors will be, to, uh, will be to provide the execution of commands. 
So while, while executing the command, the worker might need to publish certain events on, on the behalf of the component. For example, a worker wants to, uh, wants to publish its current position. And in order to do so, uh, it will use a PubSub manager. This is again an actor provided by framework. The responsibility of PubSub manager is to do the bookkeeping of the subscribers. Uh, and whenever the worker publishes any event, the PubSub manager will notify all the subscribers. So once the execution of the command completes, worker needs to somehow mark the completion of the command. And to do so, it will use another actor, which is command response manager, again an actor provided by the framework. So worker will simply go ahead and mark the completion, and command response manager will be having a list of subscribers that it needs to notify once this completion happens. So this is pretty much the gist of what a TMT component will be having it. With this, uh, with this understanding, uh, we'll try to understand the responsibility of supervisor in, in a bit detail. So supervisor is going to register itself with Acacia DT because it's the front facing of the component and any communication to a component will go via supervisor. Obviously, because if supervisor is the first thing that is receiving the message, all the filtering and the validation that a component requires can sit in the supervisor. For example, if the component has started in the idle state and assembly tries to send a command for execution, HCD will just discard it. I'm, I'm not running, I, I'm in the idle state, I can't execute it. So that's, that's the example there. The next thing is, a supervisor will also manage the life cycle of a component, which means that it will help restart the component in case of exception encountered during execution. Let's try to understand this with this diagram here. Uh, let's say there is any exception occurred at handlers or at top level actor. Then this exception is going to bubble up till supervisor. Supervisor will apply the restart strategy and will bring the component in the clean slate. And once the restart happens, the actor reference of the top level actor is going to get changed. So if you notice, the supervisor is not affected by this exception and its actor reference is still the same. And that's why it is preferred that we expose supervisor as the address of a component and not, not any other actors that we have here. So going back to our supervisor slide, uh, supervisor also provides the admin interface for example, if any system operator in the telescope wants to restart a particular component or shut it down or change the log level dynamically when the component is running, all these APIs or all this uh, functionality is also provided by supervisor. Okay, so the role of a typed actors in TMT. So I'll uh, try to explain typed actors very briefly. Uh, typed actors, in the definition of the actor ref, I also get an additional information which is of type. And this type is the set of messages that the actor will understand in its lifespan. So in, if I go back to my diagram here, all the actors which are in blue provided by the framework are all typed actors here. And Generally, actors give you a way of defining the communication protocol between components, and typed actors make this communication protocol explicit at compile time. Currently, we are using the mutable version of typed actors. All the actors are mutable uh, in, in our code base. And we are also storing this typed actor reference in Akasi RDT. As we have already talked, it is the supervisor's actor reference. So with this uh, usage of typed actors in TMT, we would like to share some of our learnings here. The first point is that sealed messages for typed actors turned out to be quite rigid. If I have to explain this point, let's try to understand the message hierarchy of a supervisor. Since the supervisor is the front facing of a front facing of a component, Supervisor needs to understand messages that it is going to receive from the external entities. So an HCD needs to understand what all messages assemblies is going to send. 
So supervisor also needs to understand messages that the actors running internally in the component will be sending. So right now supervisor has two sets of messages, one from the external entity, one from the internal actors. Along with this, the supervisor also needs to understand messages based on the lifecycle state. So if a component is in idle state or restarting state, I will discard messages like execute a command. So right now I have a supervisor with three sets of messages. And since I'm using the uh, sealed message hierarchy, I end up putting all these three set of messages in a single file. And if I have these three sets of messages in a single file, it is, it, it, it is a pretty large file and it is quite a headache while maintaining it. Sometimes if, even if we look at the file, we don't understand what, 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 we, wrote, what we wrote earlier. So it, it is kind of a tech date here. That's how we feel. And uh, if uh, I have to solve this problem, why not have a union type support in the language? And if, if I have a union type support, I'll be able to write these three messages in a separate file. And when, I'm, when I will define the uh, supervisor definition, I will say ex external messages or internal messages or lifecycle state messages, and it gives me the modularity that I'm aiming for. The second point is that uh, we are using the mutable version of the uh, typed actors because we felt it was familiar with untyped actors. Uh, it, it, it was very similar in terms of handling the state. But as we have uh, come one year apart of using the mutable typed actors, we realized that immutable actors are also uh, good enough to do everything that we want. So we might actually uh, think about migrating from mutable to immutable version sometime in near future. The next point is that the type information of actor refs are not preserved during serialization. So I'll try to take this point a little bit slow and I try to explain it with an example. Uh, assembly needs to discover etcd, and that's why etcd will register its supervisor's actor reference in Akasi RDT. When it registers, the actor reference gets serialized in Akasi RDT, and at the point of serialization, it's only the string representation of the reference that gets captured, but the type is, is lost there. So when assembly tries to find the reference and try to deserialize etcd's supervisor, it will have to manually cast it to the message of etcd. So if etcd understands message of type A, assembly will have to manually cast it to type A. But if assembly makes a mistake and cast it to B, there is no error that, has, that, that gets thrown at the deserialization point. But only when assembly sends the first message to etcd of type B, it's then that the etcd will throw an error, saying that I don't understand messages of type B, only send me messages of type A. But this is quite late in terms of knowing this problem in the whole process. So the probable solution is that uh, if there was a way of carrying this type information while serializing any actor reference, at deserialization point, I'll be able to determine the type and I'll, I'll, I'll have less risk of manually casting it to incorrect type. So if I were to just uh, summarize the learnings, sealed messages need a better way to modularize it. Mutable actors, good, familiar. Immutable actors are also good enough. Uh, we need some way to uh, reduce the risk of losing the type while serializing and deserializing. OK. So we'll go to the demo. And uh, we'll try to explain what these three blocks are. Uh, of course, Unmesh has explained a bit. TCS assembly, program assembly, and prob etcd. TCS assembly is responsible for moving the hardware portions in the telescope, and that's why it is a telescope control system. In this demonstration, it is going to move a motor, uh, motor assembly, uh, some, some hardwares, with the help of prob arm assembly and prob etcd. The timers that you see here, uh, let me try to explain each one. The timer that we see at the bottom of the screen, we need this, this timer at the hardware level so that it can publish its current position at a certain frequency. And all the interested software will be listening to this current position. Similarly, the timer at the uh, top part, 
is, is something that assembly will use to, to send the messages at a certain frequency and not bombard bombard it, bombard the probe arm assembly with a lot of messages. So I just try to say what happens here. The timer of uh, 50 milliseconds at TCS assembly, when it goes on, it will generate some coordinates, let's say 20, 35. These coordinates are for probe arm assembly. So it will send it to probe arm assembly and probe arm assembly will simply update its demand state as 20, 35. It will just sit there doing nothing. There is another timer that, that is running at uh, probe HCD. And when, that, and when that timer goes, it produces its current state, which is 1010. The probe HCD will publish this current state 1010 to probe arm assembly. And when probe arm assembly receives it, it, update it, it will update its current state. Now probe arm assembly knows the current state is 1010 and demand state is 2025, 2035. So it is going to calculate the next move, which is 20, 20, uh, 10, 25, sorry, sorry for the mistake, 10, 25. When, when the next move has been calculated, it is going to send these coordinates to probe HCD, and probe HCD is just going to update its state that my next move is 10, 25. It will do nothing, it will just sit there until the timer goes. And when the timer goes for probe HCD, it is going to move the hardware to 1025, get the current position, and again publish it to the probe arm assembly. So that's how it will go in the loop. Uh, I'll try to uh, also do the demonstration for the same. Okay, so I have a cluster seed here, which I need to start as the first thing. And once it is started, I will have the uh, TCS assembly that I'll start next. So the top level one is the location agent. Uh, it's part of the service discovery mechanism that I talked about. Yeah. As you see from the logs, it is successfully registered with, uh, with our uh, CRDT with its unique name, which is TCS assembly, assembly ACTA. Next, I'll start the uh, probe HCD. Uh, it is also registered successfully with our ACTA CRDT. Okay, so uh, the, TC, uh, the probe arm assembly has started and it has started receiving its demand state from TCS assembly and as you can see, the HCD is re continuously receiving the next move command from program assembly. So if I have to just search here, it will it has been receiving the demand state from TCS assembly, and it is also knowing the current state of the hardware, which is ten, which is which is this number here. Okay, so I just move back here. So I'll just quickly introduce our team. Uh, we, have three, uh, we have teams divided at three places. The ThoughtWorks Pune, the uh, team from which we belong. Uh, there is one more team in TMT, uh, which is the head office in Pasadena, and Indian, Indian Institute of Aerophysics in Bangalore, India. That's our third team. Uh, our project is open source. You can uh, go ahead and look. Thank you. Any questions?